One, two. You good to go? Are we good to get started? Yes. Uh, sweet. So on a wonderful summer's day uh, in Dublin, I'd like to welcome you all to INOG 7. This is the seventh uh, meetup in the series. Thank you very much to Zendesk, who are hosting us today. Like a little round of applause. Thank you very much. So for those of you that don't know uh, everyone here, my name is Donal. Uh, this is Christian. Uh, this is Vicente. Is that right? That's the right pronunciation, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, I didn't say it wrong this time. Um, we're going to give you just like a quick preamble, a quick welcome before we get into the talks. Uh, as you can see, we're going to do four lightning talks, um, and then we're going to break uh, for some more socializing. Um, feel free to interact with people, uh, go up and say hello. Uh, for the first timers, um, what is INOG? So INOG is the Irish Network Operators Group. It's a sort of a reimagining of what a network operators group is. So you don't have to have an ASN. You don't have to be involved in peering. You just have to have an interest in building, owning, operating, designing, playing with networks, um, and anything peripheral on that. And we welcome you. And yeah, just come say hi. Um, thank you to everyone who's come this evening. Um, as it's a nascent community, we will be taking, uh, if that's OK with you guys, a couple of photos. Um, we're going to record the sessions as well. And then we're going to punt them up online as soon as we can, all things being well. Uh, this is a new space with new tech. So thank you very much to, to Zendesk. Um, normally, I've got a printout, but I just keep looking at the screen to see where we're at. OK, so from a privacy perspective, if you have any issues with your image or your likeness, being in either any of the videos or photos, please let myself, Christian, or Vicente know. And um, I don't know, we'll pixelate you, or we won't use those photos or whatever. But um, we will be taking a couple of shots just for marketing and, and uh, community building. Um, there's something that's really important to us, uh, which if you'd bear with us just for a moment, I'm going to read out. Um, it's the essentially the code of conduct. Uh, there is a long version up on the website on inog.net. We have borrowed from the conference code of conduct. And the quick version, if you'll just bear with me for 30 seconds, is um, our meetup or conference is dedicated to providing a harassment-free conference and meetup experience for everyone, regardless of gender, uh, gender identity and expression, age, sexual orientation, disability, physical appearance, body size, race, ethnicity, religion, or lack thereof, or technology choices. Uh, we do not. <laughs> Is that new? I'm reading from the website. <laughs> wow. OK, cool. <laughs> All right. So not, not to undercut the seriousness. Um, we do not tolerate any harassment of conference or meetup participants in any form. Uh, sexual language and imagery is not appropriate for any uh, me uh, conference venue meetup, including talks, workshops, parties, Twitter, and other online media. Conference participants violating these rules may be sanctioned or expelled from the conference or meetup with or without a refund, or without a refund, at the discretion of the meetup organizers. So thank you for uh, listening to that. It's important to us in building community. Um, one other thing really quickly is uh, we've got a little bit of time for questions at the end of each of the lightning talks. So if you are going to ask a question, I'm going to pass around this microphone. Maybe just state your name for the record. And so we know uh, the presenter, who the, they know who they're speaking to. Um, again, INOG is relatively new. So you can go to inog.net, uh, v4, or v6 enabled. Uh, join us on Slack, go register at Meetup, or find us at, Meet, uh, at Twitter. Um, and that's pretty much my intro. I'm going to hand over to Christian Serbu real quickly uh, to finish off some of the admin. Um, here you go. Thank you, Donald, especially for the nice uh, ending for, uh, for the Code of Conduct. I'm not sure where you were reading it from, really. But, but I really liked it. Very, very, very smooth. <laughs> Uh, and very relevant for a, for a community of engineers. Sorry? <laughs> um, 
I can't remember now if you mentioned it, but please, while we have people presenting, put your phones on silent. Um, and um, just a, li a, li a little call we have every time is basically, uh, you you've noted that, noticed that this is done uh, as a volunteering effort. So we're always looking for, for people that actually want to help with any aspect of organizing or getting people to talk, uh, getting people, getting ideas for new content for meetings or for new locations. We've been really blessed up until now and uh, people have offered a lot of amazing locations with a lot of good food and, and drink for us to enjoy. So thank you very much to all of our previous hosts and all, all uh, future ones as well that are on the list. Uh, but, you know, as I said, we're always looking and if you've offered something and we haven't gotten back to you, it's either because we're bad at what we do and we lost your contact details <laughs> or because, you know, we're waiting for, for a date to come up when, when we will actually come and visit you. Don't worry if you've offered, we'll take it. Um, so at the end of every meeting, we'll have a short survey and probably later on this year, we're gonna have another big longer survey. Um, the more of these you fill out, uh, the better for us it is to understand what you expect and what you would like to see in future INOGs and what you would like from the community apart from all the regular meetings that we have. Uh, as, as Donald said, we have certain ways of interacting with the community right now. If you don't like them, if you think there are better ones, if you think there are ways to improve them, please get in touch and, and, and let us know. Um, I can see that the Slack channel, uh, the, you know, the Slack team is starting to get a bit more livelier than, than before, which is, which is always great to see. And um, we've seen a few uh, very interesting technical conversations already over there and some really good banter as well. So that's, that's pretty important for me. So uh, with that said, I think we're pretty much done with, uh, with the intro part. Uh, there is um, Vicente here. I'll, I'll give the mic over to him just for, I think most of you already know where the booze is, but uh, he, he's going to tell you all the other stuff, like uh, toilets, exits, and, and whatever else. So, Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Donald. So first of all, I would like to welcome all of you guys here at the Zendesk office. Uh, this is a new space, as you guys realize and people said. So. Uh, I really apologize if your guys are feeling uh, the heat. So we, we just started this, this area today and we didn't notice that we had this little issue. But I think we're all set. With, uh, at least we have some cold beers and you guys can get some refreshments. So the beers you guys know, uh, not only beers, but Coke, water and, and, and cider, whatever, it's on the fridge right here. Feel free, help yourself, wait, just stand up and, and get some beer. The bathroom, the toilet, it's right uh, outside the, that door on the corner. So, <laughs> Cassiano is funny. Just like the mask is drops out and you go that way. So, toilets there, boozes are, are here. Uh, the uh, emergency exit, it's the same as the bathroom, the toilet. And again, thanks a lot for joining us here and we hope you guys enjoy all the tech talks. Thank you. And one last thing I'd like to mention, a perk of being a speaker at INOG is that there's a bit of air conditioning at the front. So <laughs> if, you know, we, we, we take care of our speakers, right? <laughs> there's no podium mic, right? Yeah, just, oh, you, you have a just a quick uh, mic check. Can you hear me, folks? Yep. Great. Okay, folks, we'll kick off. Um, my name is John Harrington. Um, I'm a network engineer, a uh, network consultant at the moment, uh, a blogger, and uh, I guess we're going to talk about network truths, principles, and fallacies, which is a fairly grandiose title, so we'll see how, we'll see how that goes. Uh, in reality, the talk today is about effectiveness. Um, 
truths, principles, and fallacies are there to help us eke out that effectiveness, find it, uh, and apply it. Um, why am I interested in, in effectiveness? Because I'm interested in being happy. I want to take the time I spend at work and get the absolute maximum out of it. I want to be uh, content, and, and a lot of that comes from effectiveness. Knowing that you're spending your time um, and applying it to get the maximum out of it, which I think is pretty much what, what we'd all like. Uh, these guys, my uh, kids, they, uh, they want me too, so they're interested in daddy doing a good job. So what, what, are, we going to, what are we going to cover today? Um, so it's a three-parter. We're going to point you to existing resources that, that, that are out there uh, that you may or may not have been aware of, uh, where people have um, gone through a lot of pain on your behalf and shared that, that hard-won knowledge. Um, the takeaway from this today will be thinking, uh, maybe a bit of chat afterwards, a bit of debate, uh, and hopefully uh, a, more, um, a more effective decision making on your part. I don't know whose mobile this is, guys. Is this yours, Vicente? Keeps, keeps going up there. <laughs> oh, it's phones on silence. So we're after, uh, we're after happy engineers, which uh, is a fairly laudable goal. Um, so what, why effectiveness? And what is effectiveness uh, versus efficiency? So I think we're all here. You guys are here. You're interested in networking. You're probably very good network engineers. Uh, but I think we all. As engineers, we, we can fall into the trap of, being, of, of honing our efficiency. Um, to take the ladder analogy, we uh, build a better ladder, we climb it faster, we carry heavier loads. We're very good at that. Uh, effectiveness, as the cliche goes, is spotting that the ladder is, is against the wrong wall, stepping back, looking at where you're spending your time, and making sure that you're getting the greatest, greatest results for that time spent. So that's what we want to focus on. Um, also, you know, some of these expressions, phrases, truths, fallacies can come across as a little, a little trite. You know, they can seem a little bit too quote-worthy. Um, it's not the intent. We're not here to, to show off that we know, hey, you know, uh, a certain phrase. Uh, but, but it can help us encapsulate what we already know and use that to communicate it to other people, to customers, peers, uh, junior engineers to pass on that wisdom. Um, so the, the expressions uh, that, that we'll talk about today are, are useful. So the first of the three parts, we'll talk about RFC 1925, the 12 truths of networking. Um, this one, I say, is for us. It's for the community. Um, there are 12 of them. It's a doc. You need to read it. We can't cover it today, I'm afraid. But I've pulled out a few of my favorites. Uh, first that I, I like is it's easier to move a problem around than solve it. And frequently, what you'll see again and again in networking, uh, when somebody tells you they've removed complexity, be very, very suspicious. They've moved it, then not necessarily removed it. So the question I ask, ask is, where? Where's it gone? <laughs> you know, when you made your product simpler, did you put that complexity into the network? Um, every old idea will be proposed again with a different name. So uh, this, this, uh, the guy who wrote, it, uh, wrote the RFC uh, put down his name as, as a member of the Internet Order of Old Farts. So if, if stuff kind of sounds like, in my day, well, here's, here's one. One size never fits, wall, fits all. So if people tell you, hey, this is the right solution for you, especially vendor pitches, uh, and a, a good question to ask is, what specifically have you done, done, past tense, for a customer with a problem like mine, looking for relevance? And alluded to in the, the picture we saw, with sufficient thrust, pigs fly just fine. However, that's not necessarily a good idea. So we can't cover them all. Uh, have a read of it. It's very funny, but it, you know, within the humor or beyond the humor is some really sage advice. Um, that you can use to avoid a lot of pain on your side. Next up are the eight fallacies of distributed computing. Um, these, this is written, uh, the fallacies of distributed computing were written, I think, in the 1980s by an, uh, Peter Deutsch, I think, from uh, Sun Microsystems. And it was written for programmers. 
about the network. We can go through them pretty quickly. <laughs> but <laughs> you know, hands up if anybody has ever seen one of these assumptions in real life. Um, you know, the network is reliable with zero latency and infinite bandwidth, and it's secure, uh, stable, with a single administrator who never conflicts uh, with anybody, uh, with zero cost, and everything looks the same. Homogenous, of course. So it's, pre it's, pretty, it's pretty funny until you realize just how sadly true it is when you're dealing with your customers, managers, engineers. Um, you know, to do our job effectively, we have to understand these principles. Um, we have to understand these assumptions, I should say. But you, you can't use it to hand wave over your customers' demands. You can't say, oh, but, oh weren't you silly? Uh, you know, assuming that the network would stay up. Um, so you still own the network quality. You know, they, they, they are effectively a shopping list. You go after any one of those uh, elements, and you will directly improve the customer experience. You know, so, so pick, pick one, pick them all. Well, not at the same time. Um, but they can be a, a tool that you can use to set customers' expectation, gently, not with sarcasm. Um, so. Uh, I, I used to work for Amazon, and one of the, um, the most informative experiences I had was, I think I was there a couple of weeks, and there was a SEV1 call. A data center had failed, and um, uh, a service owner had completely lost the service. Um, you know, data center was restored, service owner was, was pretty upset, and the call leader said, you know, hey, service owner, uh, here's your COE, or correction of error. Effectively, blame and homework. Find out why you failed and fix it. And the service owner was like, oh, I, the data center failed. And they go, no, the, the terms of usage, the contract is we will provide multiple data centers. We'll route between them all. Uh, but you need, when you consume the service, to put your services in more than one data center. You didn't. You failed. So that, that was, like was mind-blowing for me, because it was like, an, oh, for once, you mean you can structure it in a way that the network isn't uh, the whipping boy. You know, that's, that's kind of unusual. So, uh, you know, so you can use it to good avail. You can use it to uh, inform and educate your, your users. Um, some of them aren't aware of these. And it could also be a springboard for new ideas. Think about latency and, you know, how can customers fall into assumptions about latency and they don't test it. You know, looking forward to uh, containerization, you know, um, service chaining, why can't you put a, a, an artificial delay into a tester's stack if they want to chain um, a traffic control or traffic delay uh, container between their client and server when they test. So without getting too hippie-ish, uh, the last section is about you know, principles. That these are, I, I say they're, they're, they're for us. What these are are a few principles that I have um, just written down. There are examples. You need to get your own. Um, but there are things that you hit on a, on a regular uh, basis that you need to, um, uh, I guess, try not to hit continually. So um, the first is, from my perspective, this is one thing I always say, is that everything is a business case. Everything we're trying to do, we're trying to sell, we're trying to make changes in the network. There's a business case. We operate businesses. Yes, we're engineers, but we're in, your, your, your company is in the business of making money. So what is the decision maker's motivation? Uh, it's nearly always money, so you need to get good at uh, making a real business case, showing OPEX savings, real ones, not just, oh, it might save some time. You know, you got to actually put some time into that. Uh, but it may not be money. Sometimes uh, for like a struggling ops manager, you know, you're not gonna, really going to care about saving a few quid. He'll care about stability or she'll care about uptime. And that's what you're selling. I'm not saying to do it cynically. But um, it is important to figure out the motivation. And there's a rumor in, in uh, early Facebook days that if you went to, to Zuckerberg with a proposal about anything um, that wasn't growth, he would say, oh, well, hey, we're going to make a, a few dollars on this. He'd go, how does that contribute to growth? So his criteria were, cre were clear. You sold growth to him. So just think about it. It'll avoid a lot of frustration. Oh, sorry, by the way, never say, this is cool. That's one way to kill your project. Um, Chesterton's fence sounds a bit grandiose, but it is the, um, 
uh, a fundamental part of Wikipedia's deletion policy. Uh, it's a nice, it's a handy name for something that most of you already know. Uh, the rumor or the story goes that this guy in the 18th century, uh, Chesterton was out walking his grounds and he was there with an architect friend of mine, a friend of his who said, hey Chesterton, you really, I, I don't know what that ugly fence is doing there. You really must get rid of it. And, and to which he replied, no, uh, you can't get rid of that fence precisely because you don't know what it's there for. So w when you think about it, how many Sev ones have you seen caused by somebody saying, What's that doing there? Just get rid of it. You know, the, 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 the burden of proof is on you as the person getting rid of it to try and find out what it's there for. Um, but again, you can't use that as a, an excuse for intransigence. You can't just say, oh, well, nobody knows what it's there for. Sometimes, uh, to take the Gordian knot analogy, sometimes you just look at this bundled mess and you try and cover or cap the downside and just cut through the problem. Sometimes you just need to be a little bit bold. Uh, but do it in the knowledge that you're probably going to cause an outage. Um, design with empathy. Um, sounds a bit uh, tree-hugging, but you know, we're, all, we're a community of network engineers as you see here today. Uh, it's hard, it takes effort to design low-maintenance networks. Um, but it's, it's a worthy goal. It's, it's worth doing. Um, out of consideration for your peers who get that page at 3 o'clock in the morning going, I've never seen this network device before. You, you, you know what that feels like. And, and it is wor uh, wor uh, uh, working to avoid hitting that again. Uh, but selfishly, it eventually all comes back, down, back to you. You know somebody's going to find you the next day and say, you screwed me over last night. I, I don't appreciate that. So, you know, it, it is a worthy goal. It's worth doing. It should be a part of every design to say, how is this maintained? And what steps have you taken to make this a low maintenance network? Uh, because that, that is a, a, a good design goal. And my last point is, is to automate process, not problems. Uh, automation is rightly uh, front and center in most people's minds at the moment. But we seem to have kind of skipped a step where we take a process that neither you nor I can describe and say to an, engine, to a, uh, an, an ops or a, uh, a coder, hey, can you, uh, you just automate that? And they say, well, automate what? And you're like, well, you know, you know, switch deployment. And you go, okay, well, can we do the first step, which is we sit down and in a team of three people try and agree on what the switch deployment process actually is, and you won't find consensus. You'll find this branching if then, but I do it this way. You know, 80% of the win can be sitting down, writing out the process, and then looking at it on paper and go, but that's ridiculous. Optimize the process, then automate it, and then you really get your goal. In, in reality, there shouldn't be such a thing as an automation project. There should be an improvement project of which automation is one of the, the last steps. So um, those are my tips. Um, that uh, you know, I, I, I've noticed um, you will have your own. Uh, and I guess what we'd like to do is have a bit of debate about it and go, well, look, how can we as a community share these knowledge and tips and tricks that help avoid, avoid pain, make us more effective, uh, and ultimately, I hope, increase your happiness. So thank you. So I think I've pretty much used all of the time budget uh, the, and the question time as well, but uh, I think we have time for one or two, yeah? If anyone wants to ask something or to make a statement, hands up. Great. Thank you, Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. So guys, I forgot to say before, there are a bunch of snacks here. Feel free to come in, come in and grab something. And we're going to have some pizza coming in 40 minutes, maybe. So. OK, so next up is Amanda from Workday. Amanda, you're talking about JSNAP automating deployments. Is that right? Change validation. Okay. 
Just give us a second or two while we get set up. Hey, just, just out of curiosity, how is the temperature? Is it too hot, just warm, toasty? We're all right? If you've got an extra layer, take it off, but don't go too far. You'd be all right. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Wisdom from Cassiano. <laughs> I'm thinking of some weird dystopian future, post-apocalyptic thing. Uh, okay, Amanda, are you all right? How are we going? Uh. Lapel. Oh, move it up a bit. There we go. Pal a little bit, up the lapel mic. Can you hear me now? Yeah? Yep. Yep. OK, cool. All right, folks. Um, that was actually a nice lead in from John, actually, um, just in regards to optimizing the process first and then automate. So uh, what I'm talking about is uh, JSNAP, which is Juniper Snapshot, um, which I'll get into in more detail in a second. Um, it's basically a tool, it's a freeware tool that Juniper offer that is, uh, can be used to capture network validation states, so runtime state of network devices. Um, and I hope, time allowing, I should give a quick little demo that I've sort of semi-baked uh, for this talk as well. Um, so basically, yeah, network engineers, we're constantly involved in planning and executing network changes. And we should be concerned with the state of the network after the change has been applied. Um, and the truth is, nobody wants to go home, especially at 5 a.m. in the morning, after a long night's you know, maintenance window, and receive a call from the NOC saying that there's a problem with the network, especially in the area where your changes were applied that could have been avoided. So the agenda is, I'm going to walk through a quick um, uh, change window here with my friend here, uh, Ted Stryker. And uh, um, then we're going to uh, approaching some best practices for approaching a network uh, maintenance window change. How does JSNAP help? And then the demo. So I'm sure a few of you, this is how I feel sometimes on a, a network maintenance window change, especially on a fairly risky change. So this is our network engineer, Ted Stryker. This is the, this is the paper I here today. Yeah, exactly. I think it's rather appropriate for this room, yeah. <laughs> yeah demo. Can I get you to use that until the demo? Yeah, sure. Is that all right? Yeah. Come again? Oh. Uh, the roof. oh, yeah. So uh, the network engineer, Ted Stryker, he starts his change at 11.45 PM. And his verification procedure takes uh, 30 minutes approximately, let's say, to collect all his commands. So he's collecting his, um, his con running configs, his show state. So perhaps he's doing show IP, OSPF neighbors, show BTP. Um, LLDP neighbors, et cetera, that on all the devices that are going to be affected by the change. So then at around 12, 15 AM, the engineer does the change. And let's say it's not a particularly big change. Let's say he's just doing a firmware upgrade, but on a large volume of network devices. Um, so he finishes his change then at 3.30 AM. He's still sweating and begins to collect all the commands on, once again on all the devices that were affected by the change. So he runs through the entire verification step one more time. And then by 4 AM, he has to start comparing the output of these one by one. So that's fine if you're doing like your, the devices infected or affected were infected, well, it depends. Affected were five devices. But if it's 100, 200 devices in the change that, you know, that were impacted by this change, it's pretty hard to walk, by, walk through every single one of the runtime states, running configs, et cetera on every single one of those devices, one by one, and get everyone 100% accurately. Yeah, get every one of those 100% accurately correct, that you, you haven't missed anything. So basically, after a couple of um, devices, he's basically, he looks through uh, the configs, he looks through the runtime state, and he cuts, through, he cuts short the validation. And he assumes basically that all the devices are okay. So by 5 a.m., he calls a quit and he closes out the change and he deems it a success after completing, let's say, 30% of the post-check validation. And he sees no apparent issue. 
And then the alarms start to come in. It's 5.30 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, who hasn't been in this situation? A better plan would have been to identify that the verification steps were too long for a single engineer to execute, and that added resources probably were needed to run the verification process. Or an alternative would have been, maybe you could have automated this step better, the verification process. So approaching a maintenance window change. Now this isn't a fully comprehensive list. It's just a couple of bullet items I've put up. I mean, there's a lot more things you can do. Um, but as a general rule of thumb, you should have good change control of the process. Um, so you should have a cab board review process. You know, more than one set of eyes should see your change and certainly approve what you're deeming to put on the network, certainly if, if that change is particularly high risk. Um, you should have effective monitoring. Um, you should have a backup of the running config and potentially the firmware, if, especially in the case of where you may be doing a particularly a firmware upgrade that could, for whatever reason, go rogue and you need to recover the original firmware that was on the device. Um, you need to capture the baseline runtime state, the pre-check. You need to apply your change then, you need to wait. Then you need to capture your base, baseline runtime state post-check. And then you need some may, way to compare the pre-checks and the post-checks. And then if, if things screw up, then you need a rollback plan and a solid rollback plan. And it needs to be a rollback plan as well that anyone can implement. So you may not be the person implementing that rollback. It could be you know, it's, you know, a level one engineer. Um, but it needs to be very well documented every step of the change and also the rollback of the change. And I do find that sometimes the rollback in regards to large, complex changes is an afterthought. People don't always give enough due diligence to rollback. So this is um, one way of doing pre and post checks. I'm not, I'm not advocating this method. But um, we've got a switch here at the top. And we've got a switch here in the middle. Um, and we've done a change. And what's happened as part of that change is our friend, oops. Our friend here at ASW 011 has uh, disappeared. So um, <clears throat> what I'm using here is just Sublime Text Editor. Now it's, you know, it's one way you can diff um, operational runtime state of two devices. There's lots of different ways you can do it. People just use Linux diff. People have various other tooling, I hope, to do this in a more effective way than what I'm showing here. Um, but I'm just kind of showing this is one piece of state data. So for one network device, if you had 200 network devices, are you going to do this for every single network device? And then you also might have to capture OSPF state data, um, possibly BGP state data, a whole interface state data, a whole ream of different types of state data. So this is where JSNAP comes into play. So it's Juniper Snapshot Administrator. Um, I've popped up its GitHub link. And I've also popped up a link to an RPM. So the caveat with the RPM is it's, you can download it onto a CentOS type OS. So you can install it on Ubuntu or um, Debian type OS. So you have to fall back to the source code instead. Um, what it does is it takes a snapshot of your environment runtime state, and it saves it as XML. And then it can parse it using slacks, off-box slacks. Um, It'll basically compare the post and pre XML, and it generates a human readable report of the differences. So it only highlights what's changed. So you're only interested in seeing what have I broke, basically. So it's made up of three main components. Um, there's the actual Slack scripts themselves. Um, just call out, these are written by Jeremy Schulman, in, who ex Juniper employee. And they're basically, what he's done is he's taken put a lot of, taking a lot of the manual hardship out of having to figure out how to parse XML by creating these pre-baked scripts. And what the scripts do in essence is they have defined a bunch of functions and those functions are things like, you know, is, he's defined like things like um, operate, operator statements like is less than, is more than, is diff, no diff, that type of thing. And it allows you then, you can leverage those functions to then um, compare two different XML files and literally check something like a diff. Um, the other thing it uses is, uh, as part of the RPM install, it installs something called Juice. So it's not a soft drink. It's actually um, 
basically a off Juniper box uh, environment that allows you to run Slack scripts on a Linux box. Um, and you can also debug them as well, which is really handy. Um, and also, in addition to that, it actually runs a netconf client. So it'll actually netconf to your Juniper devices, which support net, native netconf. The last thing then is where someone like me would come in is the config files. So I, as a user of Slack, JSNAP, would create config files that define the checks that I want to see. So you know, the specific to my network devices, my change, the things I'm interested in seeing. And uh, I can generate the snapshots, the tests, and then actual, the really interesting part, which is the actual comparative of the two snapshots before and after the change. So I have up here a couple of sample tests. This is, again, not exhaustive. This is just a couple I have. Um, so you can check, you can pretty much check anything. Um, a couple of the items I have here are the alarm checks, et cetera. You can check the version. Uh, that the version has actually, on a Juniper switch, has actually gone snap, snapshot to both partitions. Um, your OSPF neighbors, do you have new neighbors, missing neighbors, VRP on layer two switches. So as you can see, this is very layer two target. This is like a switch targeted file. I do have ones targeted at firewalls. I also have um, a te a complete files targeted at routers. So they focus more on BGP, et cetera. So this one's targeted just at the checks I'd want to do in a, on a data center switch, for instance. Um, spanning tree, obviously, virtual chassis if you're running it. And then I've given an example then at a high level of the LLDP neighbor. So on Juniper, then you're running show LLDP neighbors. You're iterating over all the neighbors in XML. And you're leveraging then, you pin the neighbors on LLDP remote system name. So that's actually the remote device that's connected to you. you use that as kind of the hook. And then basically, I've, you've got two, two basically slacks functions here. Um, has one of my neighbors gone AWOL? Or have I introduced new neighbors because I've added the new device to the network? And then you have basically uh, the JSON of XML captured state here. And again, this is the uh, LLTP neighbor information that's iterated across. Um, and in addition to that, then I have an example here of a pre and post check test against a device from one of our labs. So, and I'm just focusing on the LLDP neighbor check. So the really nice thing about this tool as well is, um, if I go back here, you have these do statements where you define. So this, this file actually has multiple checks defined. But at the top of it, you can explicitly define the checks you only want to run. And then if you want to kind of override that, you can go and use the minus S flag to say, I only want to see the LLDP neighbor checks. So in this case, um, if you think back to the other um, Sublime text editor diff I showed you earlier, um, this guy is actually reporting, hey, look, this is our switch here again. He's gone down. So the really nice thing about this is that compared to the Sublime diff I showed you earlier, where you would have had to open each and every file, diff it against each other, it's kind of hard to read, especially if there's multiple neighbors. This thing generates a lovely report and you could actually point it at 100 switches. And you could have them just very quickly tell you, I've just gone and lost a bunch of LLDP neighbors. Really, you know, and it's, it's to the human eye, if you think about like someone doing it, generally like we do change windows at pretty inhospitable hours as well. Your brain, you're not functioning on 100% kind of mental capacity at the time. So having something like this is just great to be able to just very quickly point you in the right direction where you need to troubleshoot. So if you guys are okay, I'm gonna quickly just do a quick demo. So if you give me a second here. Let's give it let's give it five minutes to the questions. Yeah. So uh, I took the liberty because of time restrictions, etc. I had to kind of take the liberty of couldn't run this whole thing in live, kind of real time here, because it takes a little while to run through it. So what I do have though is um, I don't know if everyone can see that. Do you want me to make the text a bit larger? Okay, hold on a sec. It's going large. So let's see. Make it one more, just bump it up one more bit. Okay, so just to kind of, this is me capturing, um, I've, I've got four switches in this lab. I'm just gonna bump it up one more time, there. I've got four switches in this lab, switch one, switch two, switch three, and switch four. And my objective tonight during my maintenance window is to do a firmware upgrade on these switches. So it's a pretty simple change, but imagine this was 400 switches, not four switches. 
So what I want to do is I've got a couple of checks. I'm checking spanning tree, checking LLDP neighbors. I'm checking that the actual version gets upgraded correctly. I'm checking that I do that the snapshot to the other partition happens correctly. I could have added in a bunch more checks, but just in regards to screen real estate, I didn't want to cover the screen in a lot of different checks for you guys. So basically it runs through the checks, switch one, switch two, it goes, yeah, you can see here it's saying, you know, I have a, a, an assertion to say, is this switch running my desired firmware release? It's not, it's running this firmware release. It keeps going, one, two, three, all the way to the bottom switch. So, so far it's going, okay, all the switches, are, you know, it's pulled all this data. It's actually saved it in an XML file. Um, so it's captured the version, the spanning tree state, and also the LLDP neighbor state, and it's stored it in an uh, XML, uh, XML per check file. So that's fine. We've captured that state. We've done our change. I've upgraded the firmware. Now we're on to the post check. So I'm going to just make this larger as well. should have this here. There we go. So we just take a, a snapshot of the exact same devices again, post firmware upgrade, okay? So we're running exactly the same checks for consistency. And this time around, you can see here, it's now passing, because I've upgraded to this, firm, this exact firmware release. And it's saying, oh, wait a minute, you didn't snapshot the partition. So it's saying, I can still see the old firmware on the backup partition. I've got the new firmware on the primary partition, so that's the problem immediately. It moves on then to switch two. Everything else is passing. So we get a switch two. The upgrade's been successful. We've actually created the snapshot to both partitions. That's cool. Um, LLDP looks good. Spanning tree looks good. It's on switch three. Same deal. It's going, okay, upgrade passed. Um, the uh, snapshot passed as well, but this time we're failing the MSTP. So uh, I've had to kind of engineer this failure. This probably wouldn't happen during a, f a firmware upgrade, but I'm kind of just what I want to just try and highlight is that, you know, uh, let's say another related change was happening on the network. So we have a root bridge change here, and so it's now reporting. I you you define the root bridge in your network. It's now saying, hey, the root bridge has got this root bridge ID in spanning tree. And in the last switch, it seems to have, it's passing all its checks. But now we're going to do the comparison. This is where the interesting, so this one here was taking a snapshot of the state. So the state said that, for instance, uh, this spanning tree doesn't meet the assertion that we've defined. Um, that the snapshot on the partitions didn't meet the assertion. But now when we actually compare the state the pre and post state, we should get this. Lots of failures. So again, it's going to highlight our snapshot. This time it's saying, and I've actually engineered this failure as well, by the way. We've actually lost one of our LLDP neighbors. On this device, it's looking pretty happy. So we move on. On this device, it's our spanning tree change again. It's saying basically, my root bridges change. You need to go and investigate that. And on our last device, again, we've lost another spanning tree or another uh, LLDP neighbor has fallen off the wagon here. So that is a really handy way, I think, of being able to just get a really kind of quick high level overview of what you potentially broken as part of a network change. And again, like I'm describing a firmware upgrade here. It could be a way more complex change than that. Um, but, you know, just for the sake of this demo, I just wanted to sh kind of zone in on something fairly simplistic. So that is me. I am, any questions? Hello, I'm Ivan. So question is, what are the supported vendor? Is it just Juniper or is it like more? Is it vendor agnostic? And second, what if you are doing uh, not just hardware upgrade, but you are doing uh, some design change. How would you tell that out of your 200 BGP neighbors, 150 should stay, maybe in different VRF, and like 50 disappear for, but another like 10 should stay here. Thank you. Thank you.
you've, it's funny, I was hoping you'd ask me that question. <laughs> so the first, que the first one is, uh, it is purely Juniper. So it's a Juniper tool leveraging um, uh, Juniper technology, I guess. So it's not to say it couldn't be written to support Cisco or other, other vendors. Um, it would be difficult, but it's not unsurmountable. Um, and in regards to your second question about the BGP checks here, if I just pull up this text file here, I should have one here. If you just go, blah, 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 blah. so you can actually do, and I didn't show it in the demo, but um, you can do, you know, let's say you want to get a proportion of how much your routing table has changed, or you know, has any of your BGP neighbors gone away, or you could get into, you know, multi-protocol BGP. You can get into, I mean, you can get, you can go in, you can look for anything in here. And you can, you can search for it, snapshot it, capture it, save it, do the same thing again, snapshot it. So let's say you introduced um, a new peering adjacency and you introduced, you know, you needed to kind of, you wanted to see if that had any effect in your network or you, inter, you know, you, your routing table had increased by a certain proportion or decreased or whatever. You can capture this type of data here, the prefix counts. Um, but this is again, this is not exhaustive for BGP. It's just a sample of some of the checks you can do. Um, if, 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 you, if you can think of a show command you can do in Juniper, you can replicate it here. It's basically what I'm saying. Awesome. Okay. One, two, one, two. Three. Uh, just for the interest of time, thank you very much, Amanda. Uh, another round of applause. And As always, you can approach any of the presenters uh, once we wrap up in the lightning talks to go deeper in questions, and I'm sure they'll be happy to uh, show you stuff and, and um, go deeper. Uh, let's go over to Vicente, um, host prerogative. You're going to give us a talk on... This, this has kind of changed the, the name a little bit, hey? Yes, monitoring massive metrics. M monitoring massive metrics, say. Hey. <laughs> okay, no worries, no worries, no worries. And the, and the massive, the mace of. <laughs> so, are, we'll be okay with the lapel. I think so. Sorry, where's Amanda? Sorry, Amanda, the lapel mic didn't seem to be working wonderfully. So. And and yeah, the microphone. You've got to for the next. I don't know if Donald's around, but it seems like you've got to keep the microphone very very close to your mouth for it to to activate. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, it looks like it deactivates automatically. So. Uh, where is the can HDMI? Can you, guys, can you guys hear me well? Yeah? OK. Two, one, two, one, three, two, three, 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 three. So monitoring massive network metrics. Uh, when I first showed this title for Castellano, he was like, well, why massive? My servers have more than, than those metrics, but it, it, it's controversial. At least for network devices, I would consider massive network metrics, and you guys will see why. So first thing I would like to tell you is the problem we're trying to solve here. So my problem is I want to pull all the load balancer metrics every one minute and I want those metrics to include memory utilization by, uh, with a breakdown by process. So I, I want to know how much the SSL persistence is consuming in, in my load balancer. All, all, all those details that you cannot get easily through, through all SNMP or other stuff. I also want to have all my pool uh, statistics statistic, statistic, and also the breakdown per members for that. So talking about the volume, uh, here at Zendesk, we're talking about maybe 3,000 pools per load balancer, and each pool have 28 metrics, which is total connection, server bytes in, server bytes out, and also each node member which compose this load balancer pools have their own metrics as well. So that, with that said, we're talking about around 500 and something thousand metrics that I'm, I want to collect every minute. And <laughs> why are you laughing, man? So the first shot, I think that's pretty much obvious for all of you guys. We try not reinvent the wheel and use SNMP to query all those metrics. And we first realized that not all the metrics were available as, as uh, factory vendor MIBs. And we realized that we could craft our own custom MIBs and solve that problem. But that was not really easy to scale. 
since we need to create custom OIDs and run bash commands to collect that metric, so it was a mess. And, but we tried that, we actually tried that, and what happened? The SNNP daemon on our load balancer crashed. Here you can see the log, every time I pulled, the daemon crashed, so I reached out to the vendor and, and asked for support, and basically they provide no viable support. They say, well, for that amount of metrics, you can act, I cannot go anywhere with you here. So do we give up? No, we need to find alternatives for that. So on our, our discovery for that, we realized that we could get all those statistics, that's pretty obvious as well, but by doing show commands on the load balancer. And we realized also that those show commands was really, uh, uh, was having really low CPU consumption compared to SNMP. So it's, it was pretty much har uh, harmless for our device to do one show command every minute. And we got an output, we need to cook a parser for extracting all the, the names and, and values from those metric names. And we realized we could also use Datadog as our, our time series DB to send those metrics to Datadog, plotting dashboards and creating alerts. So first thing, how our data input looks like. So if you do, uh, you probably guys recognize this. This is an F5 big IP output from a show LTM pool. So here's an example on, on, on the metrics that I want to collect. You can see that I have nested ob objects inside members which have all the metrics for each node composing uh, th this pool. So this is what it looks like on the device. And the first question is why Datadog? So here at Zendesk is why utilize utilized by developers and operations itself, so let's say that all the, the applications are sending their metrics to? What is Datadog? Datadog, oh, that, that's a good question. So Datadog, it's basically a software as a service company that runs a time series DB on the cloud. You don't need to keep a local cluster of a time series DB. You just pay for their service and ship the metrics and they deal with that. So that brings us to the question, why are we choosing a paid service for that? So basically here at the company, all of our applications and Linux servers and other servers are shipping their metrics to Datadog. So if we are able to ship our network metrics there as well, it will be easier to correlate those graphs on a single dashboard. Second uh, option was uh, increase audience on the network metrics. So as I said, this is a consequence for the first thing. So all the corporation is using Datadog but the network metrics was not available on Datadog. So when people need some network metrics, they were used to reach the network team and say, hey, I, I need this. Now they can do it by themselves. They can get the, the graphs from themselves. Uh, and also there is no infra concerns on scaling up by the amount of metrics. So since we're paying for a service, if we start sending more million metrics, they need to concern about scaling their infrastructure and this is not my issue, right? So. Second question, do I need to pay for Datadog? No, if you want to reproduce this uh, setup, this, this approach here on your own company, on your lab, you can build your own time series DB. So you don't need to pay for Datadog. How Datadog is working on our environment, basically we have an agent running on a Linux server listening for UDP messages. And there is a specific format for those messages that you can send a craft UDP message for this agent, and this agent will aggregate and ship to the time series DB in case Datadog. So here's an example, you have the metric name, value, the type, if this is a histogram, a gauge, the sample rate, tags, etc. So now what? Uh, we cook the script, uh, we choose Python for that. And this script is parsing the load balancer CLI show output, is extracting the metric names, the tags, and the values, crafting that UDP packet in the, the docs.d format. And here's an example on how the UDP payload looks like. So we have the metric NetOps, load balancer, server side, current connections, the number, the value itself, this is a gouge, and all the tags that I can later aggregate or, or group my graphs based on those tags. So challenges while writing the parser uh, was initially, since we have those nested objects on, 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 on the show output, it was really time consuming to build a grammar and also doing the balancing on the curly brackets. 
So it was our lucky day because we realized that the output from Big IP was pretty much similar to a JSON output. So what we did was kind of a lazy approach, but it works. We forced the output to, look, to, to be a JSON output so we could use the JSON parser and we don't need to build our own grammar and do the balances itself. So that, that was the approach that we used here. Force the output to be a JSON and use the native JSON parser. And this will uh, result on a Python dictionary, similar as a Ruby hash, and you can loop onto it and, and ship the metrics collecting the tags. So the second shot was already using this approach. So at the pair of our active and standby load balancer, we run a bash script every minute, doing a show, LTM, pool, blah, blah, blah. We compress this and send to the Linux host using Natcat. It's a simple while true command doing that every minute. And at the Linux host, the Natcat receives the data and compress and call the Python script. Right? The Python script parses, extract tags, and submit that to Datadog, as you guys already know. So what happened after that? Boom, metric losses. So if you see this huge gap on the graph, that, 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 those are the times that our server were being overloaded by the amount of metrics. So we, we were still seeing issues here. But it was looking better than SNMP. SNMP was basically showing nothing. <laughs> so we improved a bit. So on the third shot, we've made some improvements. So on the load balancer, our bash script is now checking if the, uh, uh, the unit is active or standby. I don't need to send metrics from the standby unit. They will be all zero, right? So only by this thing, I reduced by half the amount of metric that I was processing. And on the Linux host, uh, I'm applying some filters. There are some metrics that are, that are always zero, so I don't want to put them on a graph. And I also added some splay, so when, when, when the Python script parses all that, that huge show LTM output, instead of crafting and sending the UDP all at once, I, I added some splay, so this allows the dogstat to, the, to process the metrics that was already shipped, send it to Datadog and get the new one. So this splay helped to fix that metric losses that we saw. So the results of this, how our data looks now, you guys saw the output from the load balancer. So here are the graphs generated from those outputs. So I have current connections here. These graphs on the left shows all the, the, the virtual IPs, all the pools that my load balancer has. And I can also do top talker, see who are the virtual IPs that are trending at the moment. And this is all updated every minute. Uh, there is also a cool tool on, on Datadog, which is event overlay. So if you see these vertical bars, those vertical bar means that there was a NetOps a network change at that moment. So unfortunately, I have no ways to do a demo here, but if you put your cursor over the vertical bar, it will tell you the ticket number from that change, so you can easily track what, what was, was being done at that point. So let's say you just applied a change and you broke the environment, you can easily sell, see on the graph that it was related to the change using this events overlay. Uh, there's a, a, a cool stuff that we did as well for members flapping. Sometimes your application is getting overload or something is crashing and your pool members are going up and down. And if you're not checking the, the load balancer logs, it's hard to, to get into. So we're populating the dash, on the dashboard the, the percentage of the flaps from, from the previous one hour, four hour, whatever. So that's, that's the thing that I most love on, 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 on this uh, uh, project, whatever we want to call it, is infrastructure correlation. So here we can see at the top left edge, we can see segments retransmits per second on the load balancer. We can also see segments retransmits on the proxy servers, and we can correlate then with the amount of memory used by the TMM process and the loads the CPU load average from the proxy servers. And if you can keep adding, you can keep adding stuff like uh, how was the amount of uh, requests per second that my application was taking at that moment. So on a single page, you have dev, infrastructure, and network all, all on the same place. And when you move the cursor, you see this vertical line in black. This cursor moves on all the graphs. So it's really cool to correlate spikes and see how they are in interacting with each other. There is also the alerting side, which is awesome. You can, based on thresholds or based on outliers, 
uh, Datadog provides an anomaly detection, so you can say, well, if the delta increased by 50 percentage uh, on the last four hours, raise me an alarm, uh, which can be an email or a page in the, the network engineer on call or, or whatever. Uh, here is an output from the Python script that we cooked. Uh, you guys can see that it takes like less than three seconds to process 30K metrics. So the parser is itself, it's really fast and, and I would say almost zero CPU uh, utilization for parsing and sending that. Uh, advantage uh, on this approach is that uh, dynamic discover for new pools. So if I come here and, and app, uh, create a new virtual IP on my load balancer, I don't need to do anything. The graph for this new virtual IP will be added automatically since it's part of the show LTM output. So as soon as I commit it on, on my change, the graph on the next minute will show that new pool. Is it metric correlation? I, I told that about the anomaly detection algorithms, already said that. And also the CPU consumption compared to SNMP, it's zero, nothing. Questions? And I would like to, to special thanks to Cassiano who helped a lot to understanding how the StatsD works and putting this to work on a network side. And also Stephen O'Neill, who's part of the network team for Zendesk. He, he's not able to, to be here today, but he, he played an important role right in the Python parser itself. So thanks for you guys and thanks for all of you here and questions. One, two, three, four. Any questions? Real quick, we'll take one question and then we're going to rock on with the next one. If you could just do your name. Yeah, cheers. Uh, Patrick here. Um, just a question in terms of the metrics. You're sending a lot of metrics every, every three seconds, so it's 30,000 in three seconds. How do, you, how do you work with Datadog? Because if you, if you work that out over the course of a day, that's a lot of metrics. Do you, do you expire the data after a day or a week? Do you put a, a TTL on the data? The retention period that we currently have with them is 30 days. So they keep all of our metrics available for querying up to 30 days in history. The good thing is not our problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you're, you're able to get Datadog to store, I mean, that's effectively, uh, that's a lot of metrics if you work out the maths for, for, for 30 days. That's massive metrics, but if you come to a developer who write codes here at Zendesk and tell, and tell those numbers, it's nothing compared to what their applications are shipping to Datadog. So uh, I, I don't know, I might be saying bullshit. We ship more than this per server and we have 3,000 servers. Yeah, I think they use Elasticsearch and a bunch of other cool t uh, stuff on their, their backend to support that. But basically we are able to query Hadoop Basically, we're able to query up to 30 days. But if we pay more, they can keep the retention period to 60 days, 90 days. Basically, the plan that we're using, we're not paying by metrics, but by the retention period. I can send as much metrics as I want, but they will be stored only for 30 days. Okay, so regardless of the number of metrics, you can store it for 30 days, no matter how many you send. No matter how, how much you send. That's right. Yeah. And way easier than building your local cluster of InfluxDB, Hadoop, or, or, or whatever, which also have a cost related. You need to buy servers, you need to have ops engineers supporting them, disks that crashes and you need to replace. So at the end of the story, it's a good balance. But you can, uh, you can have up to five servers sending metrics for free if you want to test. Oh, that's great news. So if you guys want to test Datadog, you guys already know, five servers for free. One more really, really quick one. Hi, uh, my name is Hans. Uh, did you consider using Natflow V10 or IPFIX as a way of exporting your metrics from the load balancer to whatever backend system you have? We use Netflow a lot, but for, for, for other stuff. In this case here, I wouldn't see how Netflow would be able, maybe you can tell me how, but how I would be able to monitor the memory breakdown per Linux processes using Netflow. Am I able to do that? Awesome. Yeah, that was a different approach. We never tried. Uh, it, it can be easier than this, I don't know. 
for an example, trying to craft custom MIPS for SNMP was not the best shot because every time we add something new, we need to go there and, and add a custom MIP for that new metric. So let's say I've upgraded my load balancer for the new version and they added more stuff. I need to go on the NetFlow code and add those stuff as well. With this parser, if they keep adding metrics, I don't care. I'm just parsing and shipping the data. So it's more dynamically, you know. Awesome. One, two, one, two. Okay, thank you so much indeed, Vicente. <laughs> this is Donal, another Donal, father on the O, which I should have as well, just FYI. There you go. Uh, we're going to have a bit of a chat around radio fun, and then we're going to kick off into the social side of the evening. So, this over to you, Donal. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Yes. God help you. Can you all see me? Yes. Okay. Hi, good evening. I'm acutely aware I'm standing between you and A, air conditioning, and B, more beer. So I'll try and keep this short. Used to be Unix sysadmin, now a network engineer for way too damn long, and I used to be the designated point of contact for a radio team of field engineers for, at this stage, two previous employers. I'll be glossing over very briefly the different kind of network types, but mainly talking about ground-based networks, typically fiber optic, as opposed to air-based networks. Now, as we all know, we all love fiber networks, but they do have their issues. And the issues are occasionally people turn up and do things to the ground they run through. Can anyone see what the problem with this setup is going to be? Well, <clears throat> bollards are an awful menace to people in our, in our community, and in particular, this device can cause severe pain and hardship and grief and a desire for alcohol among network engineers. Because the first time that they were laying in bollards down in Eastgate Business Park in Cork, um, they, uh, one of these drilled through the main fiber which ran around the business park. And they sent down lots of things and they sent down the, uh, the blueprints, they sent down all of the CAD drawings and you know what, next Tuesday they did it again. <laughs> Because, you know, on a serious note, people, let's, let's make no mistake here. This, this is the enemy. Because all it takes is one Muppet driving one of these to really screw up your day. <laughs> Jeez, I don't know, some of these wires are fierce small. And then, of course, um, we all keep in mind the proper practices and the, uh, you know, proper procedures when we're dealing with fiber optics. And in particular, please don't do what I once saw in a data center which shall remain nameless with a person who shall remain nameless who unplugged an SC fiber, rubbed it on the front of his jumper and plugged it back in in front of me. <laughs> I wish I was making this up. I really, really do. But, you know, there's been a lot of talk here about metrics and why metrics are so important and it's important to be able to measure things properly. And, you know, there's been a lot of talk about shipping things here and quantizing there and, you know, writing Python scripts. Screw that. The most important metric you need in the data center world is this, MTTB. Now, this may not be listed in any RFC, but there's one person in the room acutely familiar with this. This stands for mean time to bucket. <laughs> what does this mean? Well. There was a time an engineer was in a data center, and that was all well and fine. And the engineer was on the, the webcam in the data center, and that was even finer. Then there was the fact that the weather in Ireland is always glorious and sunny, as we all know well. And some of this glorious sunniness, or its close neighbor, pissing rain, started to leak into the data center. And on the data center cam, we could see water drops hitting the top of the cab in which the field engineer was working. At which point, a, a, a very prompt phone call to the engineer was, Jim, would you ever look up for us? <laughs> oh, you're right. I can see that coming in. <laughs> can you get a bucket? <laughs> and in fairness, um, you know, the, man, the a field engineer who was working at the time went off and, you know, um, got three people from the data center who all stood looking up <laughs> at the water dripping off the roof. At this point, we were screaming at the webcam, get a bleeping bucket. 
one of the three people wandered away and eventually we were watching the clock, we were watching it, people were gathering around, we were all looking at it and it was at this precise moment in time that the metric of mean time to bucket was established. <laughs> this is the time between when you realize you need a bucket and when a bucket is actually deployed. <laughs> Because otherwise, as we know, we're all about environmental ceiling and IP67 and not this. I don't know how well you can see this on the monitors, but there's a small condensation issue in the external electrical box. But I'm here to talk today not just about war stories, but about radio. And this is what most of us think of when we think of radios and we say, yeah, you know, dishes on a tower, that's a very bland background because as we all know, salespeople will tell you that this, this is how radio looks, glorious HDR colors. And there's a lot of dishes on this. This is Tallahill mast. And obviously this is some kind of funky radio station dish there with the special dish covering. But you know, you think you've got cable management issues, ha. <laughs> and of course, if you've got vertigo, you shouldn't have watched this, this particular slide in the first place. This is what the inside of a tower looks like or as field engineers like to call it, Jesus, that's some climb. <laughs> um, you do get a certain perspective because, you know, if you're beset with Muppets and JCBs, and really if you are beset with Muppets and JCBs, you have bigger problems. Um, typically what you're thinking of is you're thinking of another solution, such as radios. And radios typically are above it all. It's all about line of sight, but typically with a little bit of height to go with your sight, you can see, you can cover quite an area here and particularly from some of the masts um, over Dublin, you can really get quite a good view out over Dublin and see some of the larger high sites here. There's a stadium of some kind here. What would I know? And um, this is the kind of equipment that you'll see typically, um, the antenna, the outdoor unit on the back, and a shot in case of vertigo. But as we all know, we all got into uh, network engineering because it's an exotic industry to be in and it involves, you know, um, high speed cars and it involves, uh, you know, particularly um, impressive working environments, uh, data centers, air conditioned to within an inch of their lives. <laughs> and occasionally places like this. This is the, quilt, the entrance to the Quiltia site at uh, Talla Hill. Oh, sorry, this is Sagart, I beg your pardon. And that exotic vehicle just beyond the barrier is my previous vehicle of choice. Um, as I said, it's, it's all about uh, exotic uh, conditions and nothing but the very best. Um, as we all know, everybody sticks to the standards when they're on the top of a mountain where nobody can see them. However, if you remember the previous photo, this, this is how Sagart greets you when you come to the gate. <laughs> but wait, there's more. Bear in mind, that's nothing. My previous boss turned up to the self-same um, site once only to be greeted by something else waiting for him at the entrance to the site. A dead horse. <laughs> so just bear in mind, Pick a good radio vendor because they put up with this crap so you don't have to. And it's good that we live in a temperate zone with all of our um, free air cooling and all of that kind of thing. Because sometimes, yeah, can you see where the road is in that? He can. <laughs> and occasionally, you know, it gets a little bit snowy and um, you'll come across interesting sights. Uh, a lot of people, I show these, these slides sometimes to people and they say, oh, that must be, you know, the Nordic countries. No, no, that's Carlo. <laughs> this is Mount Leinster. Can you tell what way the wind was blowing that day? Brace yourselves. <laughs> uh, bear in mind that these dishes were all working. There are dishes behind lots of these clumps of ice. And uh, they were still working. Um, good radio installation practices will mean that they'll put up with conditions that humans sure as hell won't. And uh, this one is taken from a different direction just to be different. Of course, if you have uh, a company that does it properly and um, has very good install practices, you'll never see any of these things which were observed, I should point out, um, by other people working for other companies. 
When the radome on the front of your dish decides to pop off well, you can have a little bit of fatigue sometimes in the dishes. And then you can have a lot of fatigue in the dishes. And then sometimes we say dish. <laughs> yeah, uh, that, link, that link was working when the engineers noticed it um, on Mount Leinster, actually, as it happens. But bear in mind as well that it's all very well having high mass and towers. That gives you a good clear line of sight. Um, sometimes people are tempted to do things a little bit on the cheap, you know, maybe some uh, radios between buildings. And again, in Carlo, it's not that I have anything against Carlo, it's just half the stories I have from there. In Carlo Town, somebody decided that what they'd do is they'd, um, they'd run a laser link between two buildings because it was you know, much easier and cheaper than getting fiber. I can see the pizza over there, I'm about four slides off the end. Um, and they had a problem uh, because they were losing uh, the link at random times during the day and they couldn't work out what it was till they took the old fashioned step of seating someone in a chair on the roof beside the equipment. And that's when they discovered that there was a laundry in the building between the two sites. And when they opened the windows and the giant clouds of steam billowed up through the air, a glorious light show followed and a slight attenuation of the signal. <laughs> but bear in mind that that's not so bad. You know, it is a lot about line of sight. And sometimes you make good plans, you know, you've, you've done your site surveys, um, and then a link attenuates somewhat, someone complains, and you send someone out to have a look, and they say, and you ring up the field agent, and you go, Mick, can you see what the problem is? And Mick goes, yep. <laughs> Someone's built a Ferris wheel between the buildings. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this pizza I can smell from here. Thank you for putting up with me, and I hope you've enjoyed Radio Fun. Thanks, Donald. Can you hear me? One, two, one, two. Uh, so let's just say a big round of applause for all the presenters tonight. Thank you very much. I'd like to say a really, really big uh, thank you to Zendesk. Uh, two more really, really quick things. Um, myself and Christian and some other people have been having a chat. We want to set up perhaps a program committee for content uh, in the future. We don't know what it's going to look like, uh, but if you're interested, please come and have a chat to myself or Christian this evening. Uh, we'll also put that out in Slack, and we'll put it out through other means as well. So if you want to get more involved, please uh, come talk to us. Um, I'd say just a bit of a shout out real quick to Natalie tonight for helping out from Ripe NCC, who's traveled all the way over from the Netherlands. So if you want to go say hello, introduce yourself, and introduce yourself to everyone else tonight, thank you very much indeed. Uh, that's pretty much it. Let's eat. Thank you.